Right, ready to begin when you are, Colin. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. It's Friday. I start to sound like a DJ, but um, welcome to this webinar. Um, we are going to be looking at the opt-out in England. Two years, the two-year anniversary. Now, we're working with the National Kidney Federation and the Coordinating Voice for Black and Asian Mixed Race and Minority Ethnic Transplant Donations, MBTA. So we are literally here to celebrate the change in law. And that happened, like I said, two years ago. Unfortunately, two years ago, obviously, it was in the middle of a COVID pandemic. So the impact and expectations were not particularly high. So today, we're also going to celebrate how remarkable that organ donation and transplantation continued through. It was a much reduced level, but it was really effective. We'll provide information from a local and national perspective as well as highlight work done by voluntary groups. We'll go through an agenda. There will be information to be shared. Now, I'm gonna briefly introduce the people. I'm just gonna like read the list, but they're gonna actually, um, to, uh, they will introduce themselves in more detail. But we have Anthony Clarkson, Dr. Mysore Kanish, Harpeet Matharu, Orin Lewis OBE, Alan Miller, Prafiola Shah, and Kirit Modi. And on that note, I'll come back at the end. There will be opportunity for Q&A if we keep it um, moving swiftly. The agenda is to see the change, overview the change in law after the two years. From a hospital perspective, we're going to, Dr. Pat myself, Panish will be doing that. And Anthony Clarkson, we look at the change in law after the two years. That will be Anthony's piece at the beginning. And then we'll have a specialist nurse perspective from Harpeet Mataru. ACLT, Orin Lewis, will tell us what he's been experiencing. The team, Margot, Alan Miller, He'll be, give us his perspective, and Prafula Shah, Secretary of JHOD, will be there too. The panel discussion and Q&A will be conducted by Kirit Modi, who is the ordinary president of the NKF and the MBTA. I will stop talking. As an actor, that's really difficult for me, but um, today it's about our experts. So enjoy it. And Anthony, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Colin, and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, it's amazing that um, we're two years on. Um, so next slide, please. And I put at the heading here, it's been a busy couple of years and now realize that that's probably the understatement of the century. Um, it's actually been quite a blur the last two years when I, when I look back and was thinking about it, at this. But it has been a remarkable two years for many reasons. Uh, of course, we have change of legislation in the mid of the pandemic. Uh, and then we've had to work through the pandemic. And for transplantation, we had our ups and downs, but we managed for deceased donation and transplantation to keep it going to about 90% of pre-COVID levels, which in fact was remarkable. And due to the huge efforts of uh, all our partners across um, the, the NHS, uh, the third sector, all our partners out on the, the whole of the pathway, um, to manage to keep uh, transplantation going at that levels. Living donation did reduce significantly during that period, um, particularly because of, obviously we had concerns around um, the impact of COVID for both the donor and, and the recipient. But I'm very pleased to say that that's now bouncing back very nicely too as we're recovering out of the other side of the, of the pandemic. In relation to um, the legislation change, um, the key thing for us was looking to, can we keep um, awareness of the legislation in the community high during this time? Um, because of course, the news, the media, everybody was focused on one thing, which was the pandemic. But as you can see here, we did manage to do that against uh, all the odds. And again, that was due to huge effort from many people here today and people across uh, all our partners, uh, the wider NHS to achieve that. And you'll see here at uh, sort of year two, we were around 75% of going into year two, 75% of the population uh, having awareness of the legislation change. And actually it's been reasonably well maintained um, from, that, from that period. I also jotted down what else we've achieved in the last couple of years with, in relation to the legislation. And actually it was quite amazing what we've done. So as you, re you may recall, we uh, managed to be able to access the NHS app for the organ donor register. So you can register your decision through the NHS app. 
And then of course, during the pandemic, you use that app to be able to get your COVID pass. So in fact, for a period, the NHS app was our greatest input to the organ donor register, which was a great achievement um, and actually worked very well for us during that time. We also introduced new, new training for our specialist nurses, our clinical colleagues um, over the last two years. And, um, and that was received incredibly well, particularly when we focus on, on the new legislation. We expanded our collaborations with new partners and built new relationships with faith groups, third sector and wider NHS colleagues, which again, they've been strengthened throughout the two years and been with us for many years to come. And one of the other key things that we managed to uh, focus on was a renewed effort looking at organ utilisation. So the change in legislation, we know we're going to get more donors uh, and that they will come, but we need to make sure that those precious gifts are used effectively for transplantation. So we've got a new focus on organ utilisation to ensure that the surgeons are in the best possible uh, situation to honour that, that gift. Next slide, please. This just shows us, it's a, a picture around to show us um, the, primarily the media and the, uh, the campaigns that we undertook over the last two years. So uh, again, a lot of effort done with our partners and our internal team and marketing team to ensure that we kept the legislation in people's minds. And that included our PR partners. So we had uh, great input from the Daily Mirror, the other printed press, as well as TV news. Digital increasingly becoming more and more important, particularly with the younger generation. And again, we saw a, a greater take up there, as well as our partnerships, our stakeholders. We worked with nearly 6,800 stakeholders, including CCGs across the NHS, local authorities, charities, uh, and, and, and others. And then of course, our community investment scheme. And we've got 26 new projects received funding and started their engagement. Next slide, please. So what happened to the organ donor register during this period? So you'll see here back in 2018, there was 19.25 um, million people adopted in on the organ donor register and just over 400,000 adopted out. You were allowed to opt out on the register even back then because we changed the whole of the register for Wales when Wales went with an opt out legislation. So even if you're in England, you could still opt out, but we didn't, we, the deemed part of the legislation didn't apply. And then you can see how it's moved over the years until March 2022, and it's increased. So we've got 22.22.5 million of Thunder uh, who have opted in, and just short of 2 million who have opted out. Now, actually, that 2 million may sound a lot, but we were expecting about around 5% of the population to opt out on the organ donor register, and that's less than that. And again, that's a lot of work has been done with our partners to ensure that any miscommunication that goes out and misinformation around opt-out legislation, we've worked very well and very closely with them, who have quickly um, uh, rectified those misconceptions to prevent increases in, in, in opt-out registrations. Okay, next slide, please. So consent rate. So, we didn't expect consent rate to change that much, actually, in the, in the first couple of years. Our experience was that it takes at least three years and, and, and beyond before we start to see a shift in the consent rate. And that's what we expected in Wales, and that's been seen in, in other countries that have an opted in legislation too. But it's interesting to look what happened over, over the last couple of years. And bearing in mind, we were in the middle of a pandemic as well. So looking back at this chart, you can see back in 2017-18, we had a very small number of expressed opt-outs. They may well be people that are on the register, but more likely people that had told the family they didn't want to be a donor. And then in the orange bar, we had the opt-ins, the people that had joined the organ donor register and wanted to be a donor. And then the blue bar was the other approaches. So they, those were where fa the families made the decision um, for, for the individual. And then jumping forward to 21, 22, we can see that there's more uh, numbers of opt, uh, um, expressed opt-outs. So more people have said they don't want to be a donor or they have um, said on the organ donor register that they don't want to be a donor. Many of these people will not have donated anyway, um, but they've registered that decision. So there's a clearer decision. Um, we also then we have, still have the opt-ins. So people that have 
um, decided to withhold their decision on the organ donor register they want to be a donor. And then the gray bar is the deemed consent. So uh, individuals that have been consented under the deemed consent legislation. And then the pale blue is those that um, have been consented by their families because we can't apply deemed consent in those cases. May well be children, people that are not resident in, in the country, for example. So in number terms, you can see that before the change in legislation, 68% um, consent rate. Mid-pandemic, it went up slightly to 69%. And then it's come down slightly uh, now um, to 65%. And we'll keep an eye on this. The consent rate does vary um, across periods. So we'll keep an eye on that. And we're absolutely focused on, on in, continue to increase that consent rate. Remember, um, interestingly, that the, the pool of potential donors has reduced um, post pandemic. And that may come back and we're looking at that too, uh, to understand why that might be. But the biggest key to unlocking the increased number of organs available for transplant is still consent. So our full focus still needs to be on increasing the consent rate. And but bearing in mind, we don't we didn't anticipate and we didn't expect to see a change in step change in consent rate until at least three plus years into the change in legislation. Next slide, please. So looking at the um, the the consent rate by legislation type. So. Um, you'll see the top bar, the orange bar here, um, has been consistent around 93, 92%. So that is where an individual has um, recorded their wish on the organ donor register and maybe told the family as well um, that they want to, be, uh, want to be a donor. And in those cases, the family honour that decision in 92%, in, in the vast majority of cases. The dotted line is our overall consent rate in, in England. So you can see how that, as we said, it went from 68, 69% and then has dropped down slightly now to 65%. And then the deemed consent rate is now at around 58%, with the blue bar being those express, those consents um, made by the family. So the family making the decision, which is lower at 54%. So we're considering what we, that we need to get the deemed consent um, led, um, consent rate higher, much more closer towards the orange bar of those expressed in, because we know that if you express a decision, um, that, that is consent, but also if you don't make a decision, you have also consented to be a donor. And what we want to do is have families honour that um, mode of consent just as much as honouring the, the decision where they've, they, they made a decision on the organ donor register to be a donor. Next slide, please. This is the same chart we saw earlier, but just to um, look at the patient cohort and see whether that might have impacted slightly. Well, we can see now here, it shows that 200 more approaches are to where um, individuals and patients have opted out um, um, of donation. Now, our feeling here is, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, many of these individuals wouldn't have donated anyway. It's just that because of the publicity that we've been doing and they've expressed that decision either on the register or with the family. So actually that's a good thing because families are very clear that that was what their decision was. We've seen a uh, hundred fewer approaches where, they, where the individuals have opted in compared to pre-pandemic level. Now we'll come on to that, but we think that's probably um, because if you're pro-donation and you understand about donation, you know that actually not to make a decision not, it means that you're a donor. So you don't actually have to express the wish. So we think that may have impacted as well. So we're keeping, we're keeping a close eye on, uh, on how these shifts may impact on the consent rate. Next slide, sir, please. So what we're going to do next? Well, we're, keeping, we're still keeping a close eye on the, on the rates. We're looking at what's happening in Wales and the other countries, because of course, Scotland also changed to an opt-out legislation. Um, we know that um, in Wales, the, the shift in consent, and given that it was a much smaller numbers, came year three onwards. So we're keeping close to that. We're also looking at whether those that are pro-donation um, and support organ donation, and also are bought into the campaign and actually understand the legislation, I think it, we don't need to make a decision now because, well, by not making or recording a decision, I am a donor, they, my consent will be deemed. Um, and actually, we still want them to record their decision on the organ donor register. They want to be a donor. 
continue to raise awareness around the change in legislation, particularly amongst our Black and Asian communities, because the consent rate still remains lower um, in, in those communities compared to the uh, population as a whole. Um, and we're doing that through uh, further investment with our community investment schemes, and we've got some great initiatives going through those schemes at uh, this time. We know that legislation is not the answer in itself. We've got to continue to shift the dial in many other areas of the pathway. We've got to maximize every opportunity um, for donation. And um, we're, going, we're, we're continuing to do that working across our, our partners across the NHS. There will be a formal evaluation and they're, um, they're mid doing that at the moment. So um, keep an eye out for that evaluation coming through. Um, we're getting an update on, on the progress through that very soon. Um, so, but there will be a formal evaluation done of, of, of opt-out. Unfortunately, of course, it's been, um, it's, it's difficult to do that because of the pandemic. So um, you would never want to do any kind of evaluation or research, um, anything, uh, let alone when it's related to health uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So the, 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 they're having to think about how they can make adjustments for that. And also just to say, we're going to continue to work with our stakeholders and we're hoping to have a stakeholder event looking at our 20, 2030 strategy um, and seeing where we're up to with that. We're now nearly a year in with that, and what our plans are for next year and, and future years. Next slide, please. So um, from me, I want to say thank you to everybody we've worked with on this call and across the NHS. It's been a, it's been a challenge in two years. Um, we didn't know whether it was the right thing to do to launch the legislation in the pandemic. I think in hindsight, it probably was because we would still not have changed made the change if we hadn't. Um, so, and actually looking at what we've achieved during that time, it absolutely was the right decision to go with. Uh, consent rate hasn't budged as we would have liked yet, but we weren't anticipating that. We need to hold, hold on a little bit, it will come. And um, we're likely to see that change in the next year or two. We'll have to understand how the impact of the pandemic has, uh, has impacted uh, both consent rate and organ donation more generally. But I couldn't um, finish my uh, presentation without uh, showing a slide of our very dear friend Max and our hero Kira, who of course, without uh, those individuals, this change in legislation and the final piece in the jigsaw for organ donation would not have taken part. So thank you very much everybody for listening and I'll be here for questions later. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Finish. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? We can. Yeah. Thank you. No, thanks for that, Anthony. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. So sort of a, to give a clinician perspective. So, so I am myself, Panish. I'm a renal consultant kidney doctor uh, at St. Helia Hospital. So it's the Southwest London. And we, uh, as a bit of a background, cater to a population of, I think, around 2 million uh, in Surrey, Southwest London, uh, to the border, uh, to the Kent. Um, and we have we we are not a transplanting center, so we work very closely with our local transplanting center, which is St George's Hospital. Um, and we to to give you an idea of size of the program. So at St Helia, we have around thousand patients under transplant follow up. So these are all kidney transplant recipients who are under follow up, and 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 a similar number of people on dialysis, uh, of which around uh, 150, 160 people are on wait list at any given time. Uh, well, thanks for moving that slide. Excellent. So I, I just thought I, I, I'm not going to show lots of data. So you've seen some graphs. So I will just mainly give a clinician perspective, really, from the uh, what I feel as a transplant physician. So I just shown you some data there from our central hospitals. As you can see, uh, the the number of people who got transplanted in say 2010 to 2013 cohort. Uh, we're around 13% Asian, South Asians, 8% Black. Uh, and the, the thing I'll put up there, the new allocation system refers to the organ allocation system rather than the uh, donation legislation that uh, um, uh, we are alluding to. So it, it's the way the kidneys and organ kidneys are allocated. The system got changed, uh, which uh, basically uh, what means that there are more people who are waiting for a long time uh, for a kidney, more than seven years. Uh, and people with, you know, difficult to match uh, uh, recipients had a better chance of getting a kidney. So that system came uh, in September 2019. And we started seeing as, a, as you sort of 
sit in the clinic and look at the corridor, I, I think uh, you see more people uh, who have received a kidney who have been waiting for a long, long time, five years, six years, seven years, uh, and also have seen a uh, few more um, BME uh, recipients getting a kidney transplant. So I think the new allocation system, and this the opinion of colleagues uh, across the across London and the country, as well as NHSPT data, that we are seeing more transplants and difficult to transplant recipients, which is a great news. Uh, and, and the opt-out law came in May 2020, and you, you heard uh, what impact uh, it has or hasn't so far in this short time. Next slide, please. So I think it's good to celebrate uh, the, how, how good the transplant program in the country is. I think we, we should be proud of a very good uh, transplant program as a community, the NHSBT, the British Transplant Society. And we have one of the best kidney sharing scheme programs in the, in the world, I think, where uh, incompatible um, pairs get compatible uh, kidneys and, and more than one recipient benefits, you know, more than many, on many occasions, many recipients in the chain. So it's a very great. So this, I just got it from NHSBT and the ODT uh, uh, websites, but organ donors have increased substantially. So we have been doing well, and I know more work to do and lots happening in terms of legislation and the allocation system. But there has been a steady increase in the number of transplants and a steady decrease in the number of people on the wait list uh, uh, to go with it. So which is all a good news um, and a recognition that you know, we, we do need to transplant more people who are difficult to match, as well as you know, uh, people who are, I would say, quite overrepresented in a waiting list, uh, the, the Black and Asian communities, for example. Next slide, please. So I, I won't dwell too much into it because it, as, as a role, in my role as an nephrologist and transplant physician, so I really don't, I haven't been involved too much in organ donation, which I would like to do going forward. So this meeting is quite good to hear the other end of the donation as it were. Uh, I just put some numbers out there. I'm sure the, the next speaker will talk as a snod, uh, first-hand experience of these things. So I've just shown you some data on the, the referral rate for the deceased donors and the consent rate. And, and the percentage of consented donors who actually become uh, the donors. And I'll just put in the last bullet point there to say we still have a way to go in trying to optimize the organs that become available and using them. You know, the decline rate of the organs is still significantly high. And I think Anthony alluded to that. So we, uh, with change in legislation and things, we will get more transplants, but obviously we also need to make efforts to uh, make a best use of the organs that, that get retrieved and minimize the uh, decline rates. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this was the organ utilization group that got set up uh, to review uh, the whole system and as to the essential ethos and the objective is to try and see how best we can utilize the organs and what measures can be put in place. I think there was a, a, a good um, uh, consultation and a lot of surveys were done, opinions were taken, and, and there will be changes to the way the organs are handled to try and improve the utilization going forward. Um, next slide, please. So this is some of my thoughts as a clinician and also the, the uh, when, when you discuss with various renal and transplant surgeons, uh, uh, these are the uh, points we believe will help in improving sort of donation. And, and you know, I, I think the, the donation process for the deceased donors is probably long. Uh, as I said, I'm not directly involved in it, but again, uh, this is what I hear. Uh, and, and probably the families get a bit fed up in the process as to how long it takes uh, for the donation process. So certainly we need to look at how we can speed up the process and the same holds for the living uh, donation as well. Um, the, the, we have a target of achieving that within 18 weeks, for example, but, but there are variations uh, across the centers uh, and how can we make it uh, slick and, and quick enough for the living donors to donate as well as for the disease donation process to complete. Um, and if you speak to transplant surgeons, you know, they, they would say that, look, if most of the retrieval happens during night, we can implant during the day. And these are very complex recipients. You know, some of the recipients have lots of comorbidities and it's good to be doing these high-risk operations during daytime for better outcomes. What we're looking at is make use of the kidneys or other organs, but also make the patient last longer. Um, um, and we talked about reducing the decline rates. 
Um, and we need to speed up the listing process. So I'm just trying to sort of list the various steps, you know, one goes through in the journey of transplantation. So we should try and, and again, I'm referring to kidney in particular uh, 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 here. So speed up the listing process. So we should be able to list majority of the patients within 18 weeks from the time they are referred for a, a kidney transplantation, but it does take quite long. Uh, and there is significant variation again in the centers and a lot of work being done at national level, regional level, local level to try and achieve the listing process to occur within 18 weeks. And you know we should sort of drive more transplant first concept or a preemptive transplant so where appropriate, you know not all patients are suitable of course for that. but where it is appropriate, we should try we should drive a preemptive transplant, which basically means trying to transplant before the patients get on to dialysis. And I think the other bit which we sometimes forget is uh, efforts to make kidneys last longer. Uh, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that if we can make each kidney last longer, we will have less number of people with failed transplants returning to dialysis, uh, which is good for the patient. And then you have an organ pool, which is then available for others who need a transplant rather than second and subsequent transplant uh, due to failed kidney. Um, and the living donation, we are around 29% at St. Helier, and I think that's a similar national level. But again, there's a variation. If you go to Belfast, it's very high. It's over 50%. So one could aim to try and improve uh, the living donation. Uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. I'm trying to move it on my keyboard. Um, so, uh, yeah, and again, I think in the previous talk, this was brought up, the consent rates remain low. Um, this is the disease donor uh, consent rates and talk, talking about. These are the figures from ODT and the NHSPT. So 28% for Asian compared to 75% of white ethnicity and very similar. Um, I'm sorry, I've sort of repeated Asian and Asian twice. So I think it should be Asian and black. Um, and, and, and again, I see that there's huge amount of work that is going on and plans in place. So we, we just need to continue to explore what the reasons may be behind these and try and find effective solutions and also promote living donation. And on that, I'll just put right in the bottom there, it, it will be very useful to have a national audit, for example. I don't know if this, this data is captured, it may well be already and I'm not aware of, as to how many donors from say black and Asian communities actually come forward to donate and then what proportion actually donate and reasons for not donating. In the sense are many of them medically not fit to donate, you know, for example, diabetes and other illnesses. Uh, so that sort of data will be really useful uh, to try and understand at what level is the issue. I'm sure it's a combination of things. Uh, at what level is the most effective intervention we can do to improve the living donation uh, from the BAME community. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this has, already been said, it's too early to see the impact of new change in the law. Uh, but, but what I think has happened is with the new allocation system of the kidneys, which, uh, which is simplified it and into tier A and tier B. And then there are lots of people who were waiting for a long time and difficult to match recipients. How managed to get transplants? I forget the numbers. It's there on NHSPT, but certainly there has been uh, a good number of transplants for these patients who otherwise might not have got a kidney in the previous allocation system. And, and moving on, and as we see more transplants, which we hopefully we will see, uh, one shouldn't forget that you know, we need resources to cope with it. You know, theater space in the transplanting centers, protected theater space so that transplants happen if swiftly. And then we also need to look at, you will need more medical nursing, allied professionals to uh, look after these patients. So patients are getting you know, more complex, they're sicker. Uh, there are uh, language issues, health literacy, which have an impact on the outcome after the transplantations. All those things need to be borne in mind. So if you increase the number of donors on one end, but don't think about the other end, we may not see the best outcomes uh, of those kidneys that, we, uh, that, that, that are getting implanted. Uh, next one, please. That's it. That's all I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks. Thanks for that, Manish. Um, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about the specialist nurse in organ donation, uh, which is known as SNODS, for those that you don't know. Um, 
the journey in the last two years since the law has really changed. So on the next slide, um, if you don't mind putting that one on, we'll focus on what the SNOD training journey has been for the long law change and what it's consisted of. So basically the introduction of deemed consent has required changes to the donation conversations. And, and as Anthony's you know, mentioned, this means that when someone dies, if, we haven't, if they haven't recorded or expressed a decision or are not in, in an excluded group, consent to donate will be deemed. So to educate and support the SNODs in England for this change, a three module training program was developed and delivered by our legislation team. The training has really enabled our SNODs to recognize a potential deemed case and really support the hospital staff and adapt their conversations with families to really reflect the deemed legislation. So module one, which was in November 19, focused on like the theoretical aspects of the legislation and what we believe the HDA codes of practice would include. Um, module two started in Jan 20, and this was a practically focused module really building upon the current knowledge about donation conversations, enabling our SNODs to practice conversations using role play um, and sharing lessons from practice and really considering the specific needs of donors and their families, especially from diverse cultures and backgrounds. And finally, module three was designed as a consolidation module to build on both uh, one and two. And here, the SNODs are able to critically analyze the legislation and explore language in which the legislation was explained to potential donor families. A recent research by Kathy Miller, who is the head of education in NHSBT and one was one of the legislation project leads, has evaluate, evaluated the training. So basically, the training was done in in two parts, a desk-based research and an, an observation in clinical practice in the Midlands team. Um, Kathy was able to go out and observe 13 deemed situations uh, or scenarios, which actually included real life 10 formal deemed approaches. Um, and initial findings from Kathy's research are showing that the train training for SNODs implemented was really successful um, in terms of knowledge of the legislation confidence in planning conversations and discussing the legislation with families. And in addition, regular temperature check surveys were also sent during these modules. And a final step in the research was to send a survey to the whole SNOD workforce in England. And the main feedback we really got from our SNODs was they wanted more practice, um, which the organization has really highly implemented. And I'll talk about this a bit more later on. And in, in addition, in a uh, run up to the law change, we also introduced the, a faith declaration on the organ donor register. So basically, when people register, they can actually identify if their faith is important to them. So when this snod, you know, goes and checks the ODR, she, she, they know to discuss this with a family and it's important to them. Next slide, please. We'll now look at um, how the donation conversations have changed and what we're doing now and what we do we understand. The SNOD role is complex and it's a sensitive balance of, of between supporting the family in a very highly emotive time and providing information about the benefits of organ donation. So the research has shown that sometimes SNODs actually feel on a bit of a back foot when then because they're not they're not only educating about organ and tissue donation, they also have to educate about the law change. We know that there's good public awareness of 69% currently unchanged uh, since November 20. And this gives us um, a lot of confidence. And in the Bain population, it's always almost as high, which is 55%. Um, and as you know, that deemed legislation supports those conversations where a patient has not expressed a decision. So, the language that SNODs use in these conversations is continuing to evolve in the, in, in the two years. Initially, as the law change was new, the language used by SNODs was a little bit clunky and people did get wrapped up in, in decisions in opting in, opting out, not making a decision. And this observation really made the training evolve. So we didn't just say, let's talk about the law and lead with the legislation, but the focus re was really on how the system has changed. So the idea now is to stay factual. So the SNODs check the ODR, uh, and if someone has registered a decision on the ODR, then we consider them, they'll be willing to donate. 
Um, the family will at this point tell the SNOD if discussions about don donation decisions were had during their lifetime. So now, then we can be fairly certain that they would have no objection to donation and, and really go down that Dean route. SNODs are not only going in lead, SNODs are not, go, are not leading with the conversation, but they use it as a tool when the donor has not registered or expressed a decision and or if the family are not sure of what the patient would have wanted. And also it's important to say the legislation actually takes off pressure of the family to make that decision. In addition, we know we don't really, we pay a lot of attention to language you use, but the focus is not always on language. Uh, we also need to really pay, pay more attention to persona. Families pay more attention and are more bought into body language and how, we, how they're made to feel by the snod showing compassion, kindness and care. When focusing on religion and culture to support conversations, the snods are really trained on a humble approach. That being, we shouldn't be training snods um, to know the ins and outs of every religion, but to ask the family what's important to them. We know there is a spectrum um, of devotion or adherence to religion, and we shouldn't assume it's the same for everyone in order to meet the needs and expectations to our diverse population. We ask them to tell us and, and how we can actually do that. A recent project uh, for, in NHSBT created uh, something called an IDL, which is an information digital link. So this is where the SNODs are highly encouraged uh, to use a short video of core information on donation. And, and we present that to the families um, to really support them. And it's available in different languages like Hindi, Urdu, uh, Punjabi, um, which, is, which is fantastic and a massive achievement. Next slide, please. So, you know, the last part of my talk is really going to focus on the embedding period. And yes, we've gone live with the law um, two years ago, and it seems like a long time ago. However, things are still developing and we're still growing our knowledge. We really predict about three to five years before an impact is seen in the UK. And if we know there's going to be a delay in this impact, then we need to make the most of this time by growing our knowledge and expertise. SNODs are not, have not only just had the training, but are continuously to improving, getting out there, practicing, learning and reflecting, and therefore really an embedding period for the population as well as one for our staff is really required. The SNODs um, you know, attend a continuous professional practice course, it's attended annually by all SNODs, and it includes things like faith and culture and beliefs, active listening skills, using silence, staying present, building self-awareness and managing challenging situations and reflection. And one of the major attractions to this course is something called shared and deliberate practice sessions. So these include real life scenarios with uh, real life actors and aim to make individuals listen, share, reflect and learn from one another. And we really wanna try and maximize opportunities and minimize overlooking the, even the smallest of details. Um, SNODs also now have access to something called deemed deliberate practice sessions, which is the same thing um, and, and are based on deemed real life scenarios. Recently, we've also had podcasts, which have been absolutely fantastic and are proving very popular um, within the workforce, and they're really helping to embed the legislation. They're produced by Phil Walton, who is one of the legislation project leads. So we look at like dynamic scenarios are explored with guest speakers, such as um, a donation approach in which a deemed cons conversation consent could have been applied, but the family were uncertain about whether it was their right. The research has really recommended to focus training to encourage snods to continue to explore conversations, responses, and really extend those conversations, especially when we, we, we hear a family saying, oh, the patient just did not want to be a donor. So really encouraging snods to recognize that actually this could be a knee-jerk reaction, and it is actually an opportunity to dispel myths or fears. It's, it is important to understand um, a little bit more about the context of that decision of that family. And really the HDA codes of practice state, we need enough time to lead a reasonable person to conclude that they did not want to be a donor. So it's important that decision is an informed decision to avoid regret later on, which, which is seen in, in some families. But overall, we really need some more empirical research. And if a similar study was done, 
um, then ethical approval would would really would really be taken to have that evidence of that conversation with the family, so that we could have a transcript and we could benefit and learn from it. Um, and also consider video recording, consent trainings for our SNODs, a very powerful tool to really reinforce good practice and identify any areas for improvement. Um, that brings me to the end of my talk and I'll be available later for some more questions. Um, I will now hand over to Oren Lewis we'll, who will continue the webinar. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much Harpreet. Um, very, uh interesting overview from a SNOD uh, point of view. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the situations surrounding ethnic minorities uh, right now in terms of the real time look from the, over the last two years about the state of play in relation to ethnic minorities and organ donation and the change of, change of law. This slide really just sort of sum, sum up the situation. If you, this is looking back a year ago. And, it, and if you uh, look at the horizontal line where it says England and Wales population estimate, 14% is, is, the, is the figure uh, for ethnic minorities. It actually is a good way of looking at the, the, the challenges and the problems and the potential solutions in terms of uh, um, patients finding uh, well-matched donors, especially from ethnic minorities. The overrepresentation, as you can see, is, is on the waiting list, on the deceased and living donor transplants, and the actual ODR opt-outs. And a year ago, it was, you know, as you can see, it, it, was, it was showing 20, 27.5%. If you look at those bars underneath 14%, the underrepresentation the eligible deceased donors and actual deceased donors, we are again well um, uh, underrepresented. And if you take the real time figures up to March this year in terms of opt outs and opt in, um, it's about um, based on these figures are all based on known ethnicity of those individuals. It's about 58% now of opt outs in terms of um, those from ethnic minorities, those from South Asia. Uh, Africa, African Caribbean, and so on. And those who've opted in, it's actually overall around 3%. So we, 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 we have, we have a, a real sort of problem in terms of getting um, the awareness out on a broader, broader aspect, broader plane, to ensure that families, uh, including culture, including religious uh, aspects, um, have this discussion a real constructive discussion about uh, organ donation, deceased organ donation, and even living organ donation as, as, as well. It's, um, it, is, it is a real problem. And from the ACLT, the African Caribbean Leukemia Trust, and the National Vein Transplant Alliance, there, is, there are bodies of work that is being undertaken um, to try and um, make sure that there is bigger re representation on, um, in terms of those who opted in, finding more donors, for example, the ACLT, we spent the last year or so doing online webinars, we've done podcasts, we do a lot of um, digital work and social media in terms of getting uh, the message out about the importance of having the discussion um, about um, uh, deemed consent, using case studies, well-known case studies, for example, um, over a year ago, in fact, for the last three years, we've been working with a well-known DJ uh, on BBC One Extra called DJ Ace, who was spending a, a lot of time as we as as kidney kidney patients do on dialysis, and um, he went public with his with his campaign and uh, did a podcast which had a huge uh, audience uh, on BBC One Extra and talking about his work with the ACLT, talking about his need for a, a donor, and thankfully six months ago he finally uh, got his match, and he's now once again, traveling the world, doing his, his work as a DJ, and is a much healthier person because a donor was found for him. And so he's now recently done a podcast, again, just highlighting the other side of the, of the story about finding his donor. So case studies are important. I use digital content, awareness, education, which I know the next speaker is gonna, gonna, gonna talk about even more so. So this is, this is where we need to make the changes because, as much as um, Anthony and, and others have talked about, relatively speaking, 
consent, the change of law has been well accepted in, this, in particularly the Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Caribbean, uh, African communities, there's still a lot more work to do. So for us, the ACOT and the NVTA, we have, um, we still have a lot of things to do, um, challenges to meet, but the solutions are there and the solutions are on a, uh, within us. So I just really wanted to highlight this in a snapshot on this slide, what is, what is out there right now, but what in terms of the opportunities and, and uh, to raise, the, raise those, those numbers to the 14% and beyond, well beyond. On that note, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, and uh, if there's any questions uh, to throw at me and others, please feel free to put it in the chat box. And on that note, I'm gonna pass on to Alan uh, from Team Margo. Thank you, Warren. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Miller, and I am part of the small but perfectly formed team at Team Margot Foundation. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Kirit for the opportunity to speak to you all today and to share with you how Team Margot is working to bring the concept and understanding of donation for blood, organs, stem cells and bone marrow to primary schools across the UK. The next slide, please. A little bit of background. Some of you may already be aware of Team Margot, but for those of you who are not, let me give you a brief summary. Uh, Team Margot was started in 2013 when our founder's daughter, 14 month old Margot, was diagnosed with an aggressive form of blood cancer. Her best chance of survival was a stem cell transplant. Despite finding a suitable match, unfortunately, Margot died in October 2014, aged two years and two months. Margot was of mixed heritage and so was at a significant disadvantage of finding her perfect matched stem cell donor. In 2015, the Team Margot Foundation was formed and its vision and mission is to increase the donation of blood, organs, stem cells and bone marrow donors by education, inspiring and motivating people to register as donors so that everyone, regardless of their background, regardless of their ethnicity, can equally access effective and timely transplants and transfusions to save and improve lives. Next slide, please. So the pillar of our work that I'm, of our work that I'm here to talk to you about today is education. And why education? Well, currently in the UK, there are over 20,000 primary schools with over four and a half million children aged between the ages of five and 11 years old. Of those children, nearly 1.6 million are from minority ethnic and mixed and multiple heritage. That's a third of the primary school population. And we know that currently patients from these communities are disproportionately affected by the lack of having donors on the, of some of the same communities on the registers, as Orin illustrated previously. We believe that by educating about donation from primary school age, we can sow the seeds to make the changes for the rate of engagement and recruitment in the future and to aid the levelling up of access and treatment for all patients and especially those from mixed and multiple ethnicities. Next slide, please. So with this in mind, in 2018, Team Margot, in partnership with our friends at NHSBT, created Giving to Help Others, its website and education modules. So Giving to Help Others is a resource for primary school teachers, written by teachers, all those same teachers, to inform and teach children about all forms of donation in visually engaging and appropriate language appropriate forms. Since 2018, when we launched, these resources have been downloaded just under 4,000 times, nationally and internationally. Next slide, please. So what's in our modules that have been so popular? Well, we currently have six modules that cover key stages one and two from ages five to 11. There are modules for the wider school assembly, uh, campaign creation activity and the PSHE lesson, both of which have been approved by the PSHE Association. There's one on blood and circulatory system, a fifth, which is all about your organs, and the sixth, a short book written by a teenager about how we can all do something amazing. The Giving to Help Others website and its resources are listed in many places uh, across the web, including tes.com, NHSBT, and BBC websites. And we know that Giving to Help Others is a listed resource for teachers on several school lesson plans, and that it has been adapted by the Canadian Blood Service 
as part of their Green Shirt Day toolkit. A Green Shirt Day in Canada is a day dedicated to support the discussion of and encouragement for organ donation awareness and registration across the country. Uh, next slide, please. So one of our growing partnerships for Team Argo and Giving to Help Others is our work with the Organites. So these are a, a lovable, life-saving team of characters helping kids and as importantly, their parents and grown-ups to connect with and appreciate the roles of their organs whilst learning what organ donation is all about, as well as how to take better care of their health, themselves, each other, and hopefully the rest of the world. Already established in Canada through the Canadian Blood Service and across Greece in partnership with the Onassis Foundation, we are excited with what we can achieve together in the UK through Giving to Help Others, Team Margo and the Organites. Next slide, please. So what are our next steps? Well, we're going to continue our objective to have the Giving to Help Others program and the subject of donation included in the primary school curriculum. It's already in secondary school and then the organizations responsible for informing students and children have the opportunity to go in. And we wanna set that, set that groundwork and foundation. We want to press and lobby the government on the importance of early years education for achieving change, for increasing donation and transfusion rates, especially for those of black, Asian, minority ethnic, mixed and multiple heritage who are currently so adversely affected and to develop our work with partners to deliver our joint aims to children and of course their adults. Ultimately, it's to save lives and improve lives. Next slide, please. So how can you help? Well, uh, if you could make a note of the Giving to Help Others website address, please share it with colleagues, friends, family, with your children's schools, and let us know what you think. If you have any comments or feedback, we'd love to hear. Next slide, please. So thank you for your time today. If you'd like to know any more or discuss anything about giving to help others or the work of Team Margo, please feel free to contact me. My details are on the slide and they'll be available in the chat afterwards. And now I'd like to hand over to your next presenter, Kruva Shah, Secretary of JHOD, Rafula, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just want to say a huge thank you to everyone for organizing this uh, webinar. And I am Prafula Shah. I'm a living kidney donor, a secretary and trustee of Jane and Hindu Organ Donation Steering Group. And I'm also an NHSBT ambassador. Next, please. So I'm going to talk a bit about JOD and our work. So JOD was launched in 2019 uh, in Parliament. Uh, following some work done by Lord Jitesh Gardia and our own Kirit Modi. Uh, our role is to engage the Jain and Hindu communities and others in promotion of organ donation, but more recently we've also started working with blood and stem cell uh, donations as well. Through our work um, at JORD and our organ donation steering group, which is made up of 32 members, uh, we aim to significantly increase the number of Jain and Hindu organ donors, both living and after death. Uh, our work includes uh, working within these communities and the steering group includes some major organizations uh, that represent a lot of uh, people from the Asian subcontinent uh, from these two communities. Next, please. And next. So, we're talking about why do we need to do more? And I think speakers before me have alluded to this in terms of the need for uh, greater engagement and donation from uh, these communities for organ donation. And our, mo uh, our vision um, is very much this. We can do better and no one needs to die waiting for a transplant. And this is Jod's uh, vision and mission. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, figures here. So in 2021, there were 36 Asian donors after death and 36 Asian living donors. So clearly quite a lot of work to do. Next, please. In March of that same year, 725 Asians are waiting for an organ transplant. Next, please. And patients from Asian background wait longer for a transplant. Sadly, some actually die waiting. 
Uh, and so that we don't underestimate the challenge and there is a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. What are the main barriers? So through the work JOD has done over the last few years, we know that lack of awareness, uh, our faiths, some myths, and lack of com conversations are actually the key barriers. And this is what we are trying to um, challenge in some cases, raise awareness in others, and um, encourage people to have these conversations through the work that we do. Next, please. And next. So what do our faiths say? And it's important to recognize this, this message because a lot of the pushback that we get is around faith, depending on the age groups that we're talking to and very much the older people in our communities will always refer to faith leaders and the concept of faith when talking about this. So for the Jain faith, organ donation fits perfectly with its principles of ahimsa, which is nonviolence and saving lives. Anukampa, which is compassion, and Jain faith leaders do support and promote organ donation. As you will see on our website, there are a number of messages there and also some video and digital content from the Jain community. Next, please. What does the Hindu faith say? So the Hindu faith believes in the concepts of dan and seva, uh, meaning, meaning virtuous acts of selfless giving and selfless service to others. So both faiths support organ donation. Next, please. Jod's work um, started, uh, as I say, in 2019. We have a website, uh, which is uh, there, jod.org.uk. There's a lot of information on this website, including case studies and material that can be referred to when talking about specifically uh, co conversing with the faiths. Uh, and particularly these two faiths. Next, please. Uh, we have some resources that are also resources that we have uploaded here from NHS Blood and Transplant, our own community's work, our work, which includes a lot of videos and films that have been made featuring some of our case studies. Uh, there's a very important and powerful film, for example, from our Diwali campaign last year, uh, which was launched at the Bali Square um, in Trafalgar Square. And these resources are actually a go-to, and this is where we signpost people to get more information about the faith perspectives, but also looking at where uh, we can also feature more material. There are some useful links there as well. So I want everyone please to visit um, the website and uh, get as much information as you may need. We do support uh, snods and clods as well in talking to communities uh, through some of our work as well. Next, please. And this is us. So um, if you need to um, contact us, there's an email address there and follow us on our social media channels. We are uh, actively promoting organ donation, blood donation, and stem cell donation through these channels. And I will be here uh, for the Q&A uh, and answering any questions that, that you might have. Thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Kirit Modi now, who's going to actually facilitate the Q&A. Thank you, Afula. And can I thank all six speakers? We've had fantastic speakers and covered a lot of ground. So. There are plenty of questions. There's some in the chat box, so please free, feel free to, to add to them. Anthony, can I start with you? I think you, you outlined the current situation. And as we know, COVID has affected organ donation and transplantation activity generally. And the impact we know on the ethnic minority patients has been greater compared to the general population. I was just wondering what plans NHSBT has to recover from this? What chance there is, yes. What plans um, to recover, you know, because there's clearly backlogs and so on, aren't there, yes? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we need to be clear, Kirit, that it's it's going to be quite an uphill struggle. The, um, the waiting list um, during the pandemic actually reduced, and that was because many patients were suspended. So the transplant units actually took the patients off the waiting list, and now they're starting to put them all back on. Yeah. So we expect to see the waiting list to go up even further than it has now. So, and it slipped back to around about to five years ago, 
it's like we, it's, it's, it's almost as if we've lost five years um, work in, in reducing the waiting list. So I think um, we, we shouldn't underestimate the uphill uh, struggle it will be. However, we do have plans, Kirit, and I think um, you know, organ utilisation will be one of them, and we've got some um, strong plans around that. Uh, and increasing consent, as we've said, is going to be another is, is a key to increasing the number of organs available for transplant. Now, in relation to black and ethnic minority communities, um, again, it will be a combination of both, um, increasing the consent rate and increasing um, utilisation, but also maximising the opportunities for living donation. One of the reasons we combined um, deceased and living donation in the current strategy is because there's no way we can actually achieve uh, the rates of transplantation we want to do if we don't include living donation within the whole. So it's going to have to be a combined effort, I think, uh, Kirit, to, uh, to do that. So, of course, there's a chance, Kirit, and we, will, we are taking every opportunity to maximise that chance. Um, and, um, but it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. It's really helpful. And as you know, NBTA and NKF are very keen to work with you in facing these, these quite considerable challenges we have at the moment. And we welcome that, Kiri. Thank you. Thank you. You want to turn to the hospital context. I think, um, can I ask Fanish and then Herpreet, really in practical terms, how has the opt-out law affected actual practice in your own hospital? So Fanish, if you could start off. And then, then Harpreet, maybe. I was, I was hoping to just pass it on to Harpreet, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the, uh, it's, uh, the last two years has been COVID, really. So we, uh, our, it, it, the, the, uh, uh, the change in legislation sort of fell with COVID. And our, as, as we all know, nationally, the transplant activity went down. And our own center, we saw actually slightly better. Our activity went down by 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we kept the program open for vast yeah. majority of the time. And if I remember correctly, from March 2020, when it all hit very badly, till about July, August, we mm -hmm. we had to suspend. Then we sort of reopened in a phased manner. You know, we made the list a bit restrictive, chose the candidates, you know, bearing in mind COVID. So I really can't tell you whether the change in legislation has made any difference to what we are doing in the clinics in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is that we, we, we change in the allocation system. Uh, we are certainly seeing the long waiters, you know, people who have been waiting on dialysis for more than six, seven years. Yes. And, 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 and the patients who are otherwise difficult to match in, mm. uh, and, uh, and, and the proportion of them, not all proportion of them are from uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, I see that more of them have got transplant. Um, mm. uh, and the living donation went down, obviously, in the last two years, and it's picking up. We are sort of back to, uh, our list is now back to what it was pre-pandemic. Yes. And the, and the living, living donors in the World Cup is coming up as well. Uh, I can't, I, I did speak to our intensivist to see uh, what have they seen. Uh, mm. Uh, in response to change in legislation, I, uh, the, he, his uh, thing was again, we are not a trauma or a neurosurgical center at St. Helier, so mm. we don't see, get many disease donors. Sure, so no, I understand that. Yeah. Trauma or a neurosurgical center. Uh, he hasn't seen any obvious change, okay. but probably they will start seeing in the next few years. Okay, no, no I, I can understand that. But and Harpreet, Harpreet, I, no thank you. <laughs> Harpreet, I know you you based at Birmingham Hospital, aren't you? Uh, what, what, what changes have you seen? Yeah, so I'm based um, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham and really the actual practice for the hospitals hasn't changed. So, you know, units are still highly encouraged to refer all patients early and ensure that a SNOD is in conversations because, as you all may know, having a SNOD in conversations produces a better consent rate. Um, so that hasn't changed. We have seen you know, more earlier referrals, our referral rate has gone up and more interactions. So if clinicians aren't sure about law changes, they're, they're paging the specialist SNOD and that's equating to a referral that might not have come yet, but is in the pipeline due to their questions being asked. So there's a lot more interaction and, and buzz um, about, about, the, um, about the law change. The practice for SNODs hasn't changed largely 
you know, SNODs are still taking referrals, they check the ODR, attend timely and support those conversations. Um, but the only thing to add to that is now SNODs are actually um, using, making sure that they assess the patient if they're, they're going to be suitable for a deemed, the patient's going to go down the deemed route or not. So that's the only thing that has changed by looking at the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, little pockets of change, but in, you know, a, a, a big buzz on the, on the hospitals, um, especially with our clinicians. Okay, thank you. And I know we all know that the hospitals are under huge pressure even now. Yes, we hear about that almost every day in the media and so on. COVID is not gone. And so I was just going to ask again to both of you, what support you think you need? What additional support you need to, to, to maximize the impact of the change in law? And Fanish, you were talking about theater times and so on in, in your talk, for example. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, the transplant surgeons will speak very passionately on this <laughs> as to yeah, how, how, yeah. how much they would love to have a protected theater yeah. space, you know, because always this issue of the patients who come to any bouncing off a transplant, for example, you know, they, they mm -hmm. would love to have protected theaters, protected theater space. Um, it, this, there's no easy answer. I mean, the, the, the hospitals and trusts are stretched, you know, the, obviously the other surgical emergencies are important as well. Uh, and then trying to convince the trust that transplantation is kind of an emergency. Sure. Uh, it, it is not always an easy task you know, yeah. for other specialities you know, who don't sure. see it as an emergency. You know? yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that sort of thing, the theater spaces um, and the, the organ utilization has been mentioned a few times. Sure. And also the other end, you know, when they get transplanted, the um, various professionals who can then look after these patients, um, the number, uh, staffing, you know, including things like pharmacists, psychologists, and allied professionals who, who can then make a difference to the outcomes, uh, et cetera. Um, no, no easy answer. Uh, it is just a question. I think each one of us will have to look at what resources we have. Sure. Uh, think of what is likely to be an increase in number of transplants in our regions uh, with this change in legislation, for example, and then work out for that increase how many more transplant coordinators we may need or how many more uh, clinicians and other professionals we may need. That sort of modeling, probably yes, we yes. should start doing it at local and regional levels. Thank you, thank you. And then then start working with the management team to see how we can yeah. put those absolutely. in place. Absolutely, absolutely. Because yeah. that real change happens at the local level, doesn't it? it Indeed, is, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And finish. there was a question in the chat from Sonu. She was asking a question about how can kidneys be made to last longer? And I think you touched on that. Do you want to just say a bit more? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just typing it as we speak. And the answer, yeah. it is, just tell it us, is, tell us, uh, it is because we're talking about people who uh, have received yeah. a kidney transplant. Yes, how that can last longer. So yeah. it, it is, a, it's, there's no, it's not an easy answer. I think the best way to put that is it's having an uh, engaged patient with an engaged clinician. Uh, uh, and you know, imp adherence with your medications. You know, one of the commonest reasons why kidneys are lost is because people don't take medications. And surprisingly, that's true even in a free healthcare system like NHS. Mm -hmm. um, so adherence, taking them regularly, making sure your drug levels are good, other useful things like you know, weight, diabetes, blood pressure, healthy lifestyle, exercise, <laughs> staying well. And then the other, the hard end of it, science end of it, you know, designing and participating in clinical research, you know, which looks mm -hmm. at chronic rejection and scarring in the kidney, which then leads to kidney failure. Sure, sure, um, yeah. So it's, it, it, these are the things, there are things that patient can do. Uh, these are things the physicians can do. And then the research, it's a combination of all the, no, 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 I think uh, that so. could, that will hopefully will keep increasing the longevity. Okay, and Harpreet, going back to the question about what additional support you need to, to you know, to maximize the impact from a snort point of view, what would you say? Your line manager is listening, so you can you can say what you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Get my list out. So you know, the hospitals have really been highly supported with training presentations, and you know, you everyone might not know, but each SNOD is embedded in hospitals across England. So they're used as a resource for all of the hospital staff to go and approach and, and ask, ask any questions or, or any worries about the law change. 
But what, what's really important, I think, to say is that planning conversations between the SNOD and the hospital is crucial mm -hmm. to maximizing the law change and really yeah. leveraging that legislation during planning as well as the approach and really using that as an educational and a public awareness opportunity as not all doctors and nurses are fully understand uh, um, what the legislation means um, and planning conversations to focus on a real clean set of approach who is going to say what when what that conversation is going to look like that's that's really key at um, maximizing that impact okay thank you I'm going to turn to Orin and Prafula. I think, Orin, you shared the data which showed that the proportion of people from ethnic minority background who have opted out, particularly you know, since the law has changed, or even just before the law changed, in fact, is significantly higher. And you showed that in the statistics. So I just wanted to, to, to ask you, if you, Orin, if you could focus on the Black community and, and Prafula on the Hindu and Jain community, what do you think are the main reasons why more people from ethnic minority backgrounds are opting out? I, I would say from a, from a black perspective, pre-COVID, um, it was, it always has been a, a series of lack of awareness, uh, misfears and taboos, but also deep mistrust um, of what's going to happen to their organs. Um, based on cultural uh, um, perceptions and to a certain extent religious uh, perceptions. Once you throw in COVID and what happened during COVID, especially to, as we all know, what happened disproportionately to Black and South, a and, and South Asians in terms of being diagnosed and, unfor and unfortunately passed away because of COVID, it, that built in uh, even a higher level of, of, of uh, alienation, mistrust of the system in terms of uh, the law being changed and, and wanting to people opting out in higher numbers, as I highlighted earlier. And that was fueled by a lot of very damaging social media messages, on, especially on WhatsApp, that really did the rounds and got a lot of people uh, to opt out, to knee jerk and opt out. So there's a, there's, a, there's a deep and long recovery process that's got to happen based on, on um, awareness, education, high level of trust in organizations like ourselves, ACLT and others from the communities to try and build that level of trust in the system so that people can feel comfortable about opting in and, um, and using other vehicles, you know, to actually drive the message home um, about the need for organ donation. And again, case studies do a fantastic job of highlighting what can be achieved. Thank you. And, and Prefala, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, Orin summed it up quite well. And I think it's probably also the case for um, Asian communities as well. I think the lack of education uh, and that mistrust is, is key. Um, and in terms of sort of looking at how we could perhaps uh, try and address that, I think uh, trusted ambassadors on the ground, the kind of work we're starting to do with the community investment scheme, and as Orin just said, you know, finding culturally sensitive ways to deal with some of the, the um, these kind of issues that we're finding. Uh, we've been very good at actually challenging some of the myths, but WhatsApp is, is a kind of an industry of its own. And um, fake news and challenging that is actually what we encourage everyone to do. So I think ambassadors are really important. Building that trust is really important. And I think finding more people who we can talk to in a culturally sensitive way. And I think in the Asian community, there's one sort of particular thing I want to add, and it may be well true of the uh, people of black heritage as well. There is a hierarchy. So there's a, this sort of family hierarchy and people do listen to their elders, which is why we are encouraging these sort of intergenerational conversations about organ donation and, and having the whole family involved in the conversation. That is really important. Thank you. That's really helpful, Prafula. And Prafula, you mentioned the Community Investment Scheme. I'm just going to, to go on to that briefly. And that, again, just to remind uh, everyone that that's a scheme which funds local community groups to take appropriate actions. So 
it's the right message from the right messenger. Yeah, that's the concept. And there's a question for for Alan, for Fla and and for 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 for, for Oren. Really, that it's been established now for a number of years. Yes, and I think overall it's it's working. The model is working well. Now, just thinking about how can that scheme be developed further? And I know Alan, all, all the groups here we've talked about have, have, have been benefited from the saving funding from the community of messaging. So what do you think, how can the, the scheme itself be improved? Um, uh, well, um, I think the, the inclusion of stem cell into the community investment scheme this year is, is a very welcome addition because uh, it hadn't been addressed uh, in the past. So, you know, it's, it complements the wonderful work already carried out by the other organisations in recent years under the scheme. Um, what, what we would like to see uh, in the future is to see funders supporting strategies that have both kind of short and long term aims and objectives. Um, you know, and this feeds back certainly for Team Margo into our plan to embed donation in younger audiences. Yes. So reflecting on what Orin and Prafula have just said about education and where it starts, um, you know, it, it, it's so important that it's done in the households and in the communities, but where we can make some of those inroads um, quite immediately if we had the opportunity would be in schools and at curriculum. And, mm -hmm. you know, what we want to do and what we continue to do is to embed donation within the younger audiences. Sure. So that it's openly discussed, discussed in schools, in families, in a manner that will inform, encourage them. Um, and that, that will feed into that longer term objective that everybody wants here. So that there are more donors uh, on the register for blood, stem cell, um, organ for patients, particularly of minority mixed uh, multiple heritages. Um, and, and we, you know, we think that the government funding should be directed to charities and organisations that are seated in the heart of communities that can yes. make that difference. Um, and by providing that finance and support, as, as has been started by the Community Investment Scheme, um, it will allow each one to build on the foundations they already have uh, within those communities and, and change the landscape. OK, thank you, Alan. Um, Rafaela? Kira, can I Kira, can I just quickly add to that one, yes, one other quick thing? Yeah, is also also to utilize different methods and means and ways to engage the subject matter of deceased organ donation. And in many ways, you can utilize blood donation, stem cell donation, living organ donation as a means and the ways to preempt having that deeper conversation about deceased organ donation because that is the most taboo of, of all. And if you can, and if you can get a conversation and um, get people registering as blood donors, they will consider other forms of donations and you can come away with blood, stem cell, organ, living, deceased, and suddenly you get a buy-in because we must appreciate our limits and our, the barriers that are out there culturally and religiously. And sometimes you've got to do a diff you've got to attack it in a slightly different way in terms of the education and the yeah. approach. Uh, that's very, very important point, thank you. And in fact, I think, Arin, you answered one of the questions, I think, Emma was asking about blood donations. I think you've you covered that. Um, Prafala, on the community investment scheme, your views on how, how we can develop that? So I think um, both Alan and Oren have kind of touched on a couple of things I was going to say, but I think that the important thing is perhaps to look at how we can encourage um, media to talk a bit more about this from the perspective of the, the communities that we're trying to reach out to. There's a lot of investment in, in doing this. A lot of really good work is happening on the ground by organizations that have been funded. But I think it's really also important that we get to be seen in the media. We start a debate, we start talking about this a bit more. And no one likes talking about death. I mean, I, I, I think absolutely no one wants to talk about death. It's not a subject people want to speak about. So I think we can talk about that, but also let's talk about living donation a bit more. We're not currently. So um, I think those, those things are really important. Yeah. And I think, I think I agree with you. I think, it's, I think the, the experience over the last four years or so in community has been remarkable. And I think, Andrew, that's one of the things I think we perhaps need to shout more about that and you know get get more people 
then you know that what I think at least 50 organizations have done something you know over the last year from all communities right across across England in a sense and uh, so I think perhaps that's one of the things we need to talk more about it and the lessons we learned from that um, we're nearly coming to the end of this there's one question Harpreet this is I think for you it's come from me and he's asking about if you have an illegal immigrant who doesn't have any family in this country, how would they be able to donate organs? So is this, if we were looking at a deemed consent, they wouldn't be um, suitable because you have to live in the UK um, more than 12, 12 months. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's really difficult because when we do, we do find patients who haven't got a, a family or anyone, a next of kin, and we really do rely on really important information for their past medical history, uh, travel history, um, sexual health is history to make an assessment. So, um, you know, it, they, they would be able to donate, um, not through the, the deemed route, but we'd have to really gather information from a friend from a family member or a, or a GP um, to, to gather that information because it's really crucial um, to protect uh, the recipient. Um, and, you know, in addition, we, we send all the bloods um, that, that, are, that come back. So that's the safety measures are there, mm. but we really need that, that extra information from the family and friends um, to, to add to our assessment. Um, and when we register the donor, it's, it's, it's putting all that information for the recipient centers to see. So yes, they can, but we so, just- So it is possible to addition, Additional information. Yeah, yeah of, course, of course. Thank you, that's really helpful. I'm going to finish here by thanking all the, all the speakers for fantastic answers. And Colin, can I hand over to you, please, to conclude the webinar? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt. Um, that was uh, absolutely mesmeric. So what I got from this was, over the last 10 years, our organ has, uh, donors have increased by 56%. We need day-night process. We need to be preemptive. We need to collect data, ascertain living donations. Snods, interesting. Role play, art, conversation. Explore conversation, consent training. Then we come to the Orgamites, we have the children. Now this really exciting, I saw it flash up. Children are change makers in families. And that I think is really, really key. And, that, and they were talking about a third of that population of primary school age are of mixed heritage, black, Asian, ethnic background. So that is a huge resource. And it seemed, I heard very clearly that myth seems to outrank our values through faith. So, Profula spoke of the time we're in, the, the fake news time. So I sort of feel that's something that people, we've sort of glissed over, but this is a, it's quite a cynical time I've found for people when I've been arguing with them over COVID within my own community, because people have lost trust. And I think it's, this whole conversation also shows how we have to regain that narrative and regain trust. and. I think through our young people and through our, our family and it does affect everybody. So the grandparents talk to the children, grandchildren, and hopefully let's destroy these myths. It's been the most extraordinary uh, webinar. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody personally and um, to really, really stress, uh, stress, it's important that the NH. SBT continue to engage with the NBTA and the NKF in developing future plans. We have to talk to each other. There will be a record, recording of this webinar, so it will be sent to all the attendees. An evaluation form will also be sent, and I would really, really stress that that's so important because we want to know what went well, but as importantly, what you feel we needed to do more of. Um, we just have to recover from this, this last two years. We're two years in. We're moving forward. It's early doors. Overall, it's a positive, but we've got work to do. So thank you for coming. And I wish you great things. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.